Oh, this thing is off. That was smart. Oh, no, it's on. It's on. And that's on. I'm good. I'm good. All right. So, eukaryotic microbes. You got a bunch of microbes. You got, um, we talked about endosymbioses. We talked about fungi. You got some athlete's foot is a fungus that makes you sick. Thrush and ringworm and um, those are fungi that make you sick. Plants you don't need to know anything about. And there's lots of different protozoa. You got your your Trichomonas vaginalis, Giardia. You got your amoebas, those cause diarrhea. You got your malaria. You got your African sleeping sickness. You got your Chagas disease. You got your worms, helminths. You got your nematodes, your tapeworms. You got your arthropod vectors. All right, that was chapter 12. How long did that take? Do you wish I would lecture like that all the time? Please say no. OK. So I intend, what do taste, tapeworms eat? We didn't talk about this very much. Intestinal contents. Mmm, delicious. Anyway, so viruses, we did talk about before. I want to talk about, I guess, the minimum that I think will be there to get you guys to understand some basic things about human viruses. And I'll do that by discussing bacterial viruses a little bit. Now, I've, the way I've handled viruses is to mostly talk about them piece by piece by piece throughout the semester, yeah? Um, so <clears throat> viruses are in the gray area between living and non-living things. They have a completely regular structure. They have genetic information. But they don't eat. They are not cellular. Um, so. So, they are not cells. Not cells. Um, they cannot reproduce themselves. They don't eat. They don't grow. They don't move. Don't eat. Grow. Move. They, they float, yeah? That's, that's pretty much all. That, they can float in the air in droplets. They can float in liquid. Um, but they, they can't wiggle, yeah, because they don't eat. And if they don't eat, they don't, they don't get energy. And if they don't get energy, they can't wiggle, yeah, because it takes energy to wiggle. Um, can you treat them with antibiotics? No. The reason is because they don't have cell walls that, that antibiotics target. They don't have ribosomes that antibiotics target. They don't have any of the cellular mechanisms that those antibiotics are working on. Does that mean that there are no drugs to treat Viruses. No, there are drugs to treat viruses, yeah? The drugs that treat viruses are drugs that treat other mechanisms, yeah? Viruses can, they don't contain enzymes, but they can often encode enzymes in their genomes, yeah? Those enzymes can be inhibited. Viruses have DNA, and you can target particular sequences of DNA and so on. So there, there are drugs that can treat viruses, but those drugs have to work against the mechanisms that the virus has. And if the virus doesn't have a cell wall, then you can't target it with penicillin. Does that make sense? Can you grow a, back, uh, can you grow a virus on an auger plate? You can never do that, yeah? Because they are obligate in, intracellular parasites, yeah? Right? If they are obligate intracellular parasites, that means can never grow on media. If you, want to make a if you want a virus to grow so you can study it, where do you have to grow it? If they are obligate intracellular parasites. You have to grow it in a cell that they infect, yeah? And so when people want to grow flu viruses or if they want to make flu vaccine, where do they make it? At least what they used to do is they made it in chicken eggs, yeah? And they used the cells of the chicken embryo uh, or just the chicken egg itself to culture the viruses, yeah? Right? Because otherwise the viruses won't grow, yeah? They can't grow because they need a cell to reproduce them, yeah? <coughs> so they inject their genetic material into a host. The host com machinery 
is commandeered to mass produce the virus. Do you understand? Do you know what it means to commandeer? That means to take over, yeah? Um, when, yeah, so when a, when a, when the, when the pirate pushes away the captain of the ship and takes the wheel of the ship, he has commandeered that vessel, yeah? Right? Um, and so when the viral genome gets in, it pushes away the host genome and says, you're reading this DNA now. And what does the viral genome tell the cell to do? Make more viruses, yeah? Wouldn't you do that if you were a virus? Yeah, it is a rational thing for a virus to do, yeah? Um, so the cell fills up, and what happens? It bursts, releasing more viruses, yeah? And that's, that's the lion's share of what, what uh, viruses are all about. How big are viruses? Small, yeah? Here's E. coli. We don't usually think of E. coli being this gigantic, yeah? Right? It's, we can barely see it in the microscope under oil immersion, right? Our red blood cells look like, a, look like the sun compared to, to the planets, yeah? And yet, um, and yet viruses are even smaller still, yeah? Some of these viruses are very small. This is the smallest, chlamydia elementary body is the smallest bacterium known. There are some viruses that are a little bigger, right? But E. coli dwarfs Ebola virus, which is, the, which is about the biggest virus that we've got here, yeah? Okay, so um, virion structure. A virion is a viral particle, a, a little single virus outside of a cell. Yeah? What is it made out of? There's two basic things that all viruses have to have. One is genetic material. That genetic material is not always DNA. It can be RNA. Yeah? The other thing it has to have is a protective box for that genetic material. And what is that protective box made out of? Protein. And, where is, and protein is encoded by what? Genetic material, DNA, yeah? And so the DNA of the virus, what does it encode? It encodes the proteins that protect the DNA, yeah? Does this, does this seem a little circular, yeah? It's kind of like um, viruses behave a lot like computer viruses, yeah? Um, don't they? Yeah, so certainly, certainly the term computer virus came from regular virus, yeah? But, but is that, it's an apt term, isn't it? Um, how, does, how does a computer virus work? It's a, where does it replicate? It, it gets into your computer, yeah? It takes over your computer. And what does it, what does it tell the computer to do? Spread the virus, yeah? And how does it spread it? Your computer probably starts spamming all your friends, yeah? And, and when, you're, when, the vi when the virus spams all your friends, what, is it, what does it have your computers tell them to do? It says, click here, yeah? Right? It has to try to <coughs> trick you to click on that. Right? And once you click on it, you're opening that virus, and then you're, you're spreading the joy around. Yeah? Right? So the, the, the lure to the, the clickbait is kind of like the protein box protecting the, the, the computer virus inside. Yeah? Does that make sense? Um, so um, sometimes viruses have a envelope, right? a phospholipid bilayer with little protein spikes. And what do those do? They help the virus get into a new cell. Yeah? <clears throat> OK. So um, the viral envelopes are usually derived from the host plasma cell membrane. And so here is HIV. And HIV virus has a bunch of little proteins that help it stick onto the next cell. Yeah? that it's going to infect. And they're embedded in a phospholipid bilayer 
that it got from the previous cell that it infected, yeah? And it's got a genome of RNA, and, a, and in between the phospholipid bilayer and the RNA, there's a little protein capsid, yeah? Okay. Um, some viruses are helical, right? Ebola's helical, tobacco mosaic viruses, there they are. Right? So tobacco mosaic virus, what's that? That's a virus that infects tobacco plants, yeah? Every living thing that exists has viruses that infect it, yeah? And it's called mosaic virus because if you look at the leaves of a tobacco plant that have been infected with this virus, they have little mosaic patterns of, of, of cell death. Um, here is a bacteriophage, yeah? A bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. Yeah? And it looks like a little lunar lander, doesn't it? Isn't that creepy looking? Right? What are the legs, what are these, what are these tail fibers, these little legs, what do you think they do? Probably help it land onto the surface of a, of a uh, bacterium, yeah? What, is, what does this base plate with a little pin do? Probably helps it inject its DNA, right? Do you see this little line going in here? What's, what, is it, what is this little line going here? That's the genetic material coming from up here, yeah? Right? This is the virus injecting its DNA into the cell. So here's the payload of DNA, and it goes through and, right? And then, um, and then here, right? Thou shalt make more of me, right? That's what, the, that's what the DNA says, yeah? Right? Be fruitful and multiply me, yeah? Okay. <laughs> Creepy, yeah? Viruses, it's, it's diabolical, isn't it? It's super, super creepy. Um, and it's, it's evil genius material, yeah? And here we can see them, again, injecting this poor, pathetic bacteria. And what's the net result? Well, here are bacterial plaques, yeah? Or viral plaques on a bacterial lawn, yeah? Right? These are like anti-colonies. You put a lawn on there, and then each of these represents an initial infection of one bacterium by a virus when that bacterium dies, it bursts open, releases a bunch of viruses, and you can see these sort of second circles around, right? There's the dark spot in the center. That's where everything's dead, and then half of everybody's dead in the second circle where this, the second generation viruses were released to kill in the bigger semicircle. Does that make sense? Right, so <clears throat> what are these? What's that? Is it a bacterial colony? No, this is a bacterial lawn, yeah? And so these, these circles are not where the colonies are. These are, I guess I describe them as anti-colonies, yeah? Which is where in, everything is alive except here where they're all dead, yeah? But if you see here, there's like a little dark spot in the very dead center of a lot of these, yeah? So that's, right, each colony that we see on a plate represents one bacterium that was put there, that divided it into two, and then into four, and then into eight, yeah? Right? Each spot we see here represents one infecting, infected bacterial cell infected by a virus, yeah? What happens when that cell gets infected by a virus is this, the lytic cycle, yeah? Virus injects its DNA. And what does the DNA say? Make more of me, yeah? So what does the, what does the cell say? It says, yes, master, yeah? Um, and it, and it, makes, it makes more viruses, yeah? Why does it make more viruses? Why does the cell say yes? Why, why can't the cell say no? Great question. 
So certainly, yeah. So we did see that, and we heard about it a couple times. Let's let's first. I first want to answer the question of right. They don't all say no, but but um, why say yes in the first place? Yeah. And the doctor said, oh, you know, you have virus, so you have to wait because your immune system should, like, fight this virus. Yes, correct. So, you know, uh, medicine for this. And I'm thinking, if it's like coming, keeping, making this DNA, how the immune system eventually will fight this virus? Ah, so that's a completely different question. Yeah? Okay. How does the immune system fight the virus? Well, Is it the first one first, though. So... That's so why does it why does it always so why does it say yes julian has his hand up do you want to explain why the vi why the cell says i hear and obey What, the, what Julian is describing is something s significantly different that I'm about to describe in about five minutes, but he has not answered the question, yeah? And, the, and the, the best answer I've got to that question is, is that when the virus injects, what is the virus injecting? DNA. DNA. What do you know about DNA? How is the DNA of the virus different from the DNA of the cell? It ain't different. It is genetic material. DNA is DNA is DNA. And when your cells see DNA, what do they say? Okay. Oh, there's my DNA. I must have left it. I keep it here. Yeah? Um, does that make sense? Right? It looks like it, it, is the, it, is, it is the same molecule. Yeah? What reads DNA? DNA polymerase reads DNA. RNA polymerase reads DNA. When RNA reads DNA, polymerase reads DNA, it pulls it apart and makes a messenger RNA out of that DNA, right? But if DNA is DNA, if it's the same molecule, then that, the thing that's supposed to recognize DNA is, is a machine. It's an enzyme. It doesn't, it doesn't have consciousness. It's a, RNA polymerase is a device that grabs a molecule of DNA, pulls it open, and copies it into a messenger RNA, yeah? It doesn't, that device does not care as long as the, the molecule is DNA, yeah? And viral DNA is DNA. And it obeys the codon chart, right? If the viral DNA says, make, a, here's a start codon, right? <clears throat> if a viral RNA says, here's a start codon, a cellular ribosome will say, okay, here's methionine. Here's asparagine, here's alanine, and I'm done. And when the cell's done, it has made one viral protein. Yeah? Yeah. Wouldn't its own DNA work better? Well, so, so the DNA of a cell is designed to make that cell run smoothly as a... As a uh, as an organism, yeah? Right? The DNA of a, of a virus, is that designed to make the cell run smoothly? No. That DNA is designed to commandeer as much of the cell's resources as possible to make more viruses, yeah? Right? And so um, there, are, there are ways that I could describe and... and they're, they're there, but there are ways in which a cell or a virus that makes that DNA would actually have that DNA as preferable to the cellular mechanisms, yeah? Right? A cell wants to be efficient. It doesn't want to overproduce anything, right? It wants to make just the right amount of this and just the right amount of that, yeah? But sometimes there's things that we need to make a lot of in a particular situation, yeah? and other things we need to make a little of, yeah? So there are mechanisms 
that allow a cell to make a lot of something and less of something else, yeah? And the cell will want to make the right amount of the right stuff at the right time at all times for that cell. You agree? Right? But the virus's DNA is not designed for moderation. The virus's DNA has commands that, that say, you know, oh my goodness, we've got to make we've got to make this right now priority one. This is the most important thing for you to make, right? And the cellular mechanisms that can recognize that we make a lot of something and less of something else, right? Insofar as those mechanisms exist, the virus is going to maximize production of virus, yeah? And so in that capacity, it is very easy for it to take over a particular cell, yeah? Just tell that cell to make more viruses and that it should prioritize making viruses over any other activities that the cell might otherwise do. Are you convinced? All right. right so, so what ends up happening? The cell fills up with viruses. And um, this is a simplification. But ultimately, um, the, virus, the cell fills up so much with viruses that the cell bursts open and new viruses are released. Yeah. Right? And what are these new viruses that get released? What do they do? They go and infect the next poor sap cells out there. Yeah? And so if we go back to that picture of the plaques, yeah, we can see a very dark spot in the center and then a sort of a lighter spot. Yeah? The, lighter, the bigger circle that's lighter is the next generation of poor sap cells. Does that make sense? Yeah, so exactly, into all these other guys that were just, they were just minding their own business, yeah? The dark spot is the initial infection, yeah? Does that make sense? You guys got that? Okay. And so, say it again. Ah, so why does the, why does the doctor say, oh, you've got a virus, go home and drink a lot of fluids. Yeah? Why is that? Because, well, the simplest answer is because the doctor doesn't have any drugs to treat that particular virus. Yeah? Right? So, so what, the, what the doctor is telling you to do um, is eff effectively what the doctor would tell you to do if you had Ebola which is lie down, get a lot of rest, and drink lots of fluids. Why? Because the only thing the doctor can do if the doctor doesn't have a, a, a drug to make that virus die, then the only thing that doctor can do is, is make your body as healthy as possible, treat the symptoms, and let the disease run its course, yeah? And it's up to your immune system. So how does your immune system stay tuned? We'll talk about that after lunch, yeah? If the, if the immune system doesn't fight it, then what happens? Well, then you die, yeah? Right? The immune system does fight it, yeah? And there are, there are complex mechanisms that the immune system uses to fight a virus, yeah? Your, your dissatisfaction with the idea that a cell says, I hear and obey, is completely legit, right? The cell doesn't completely say, I hear and obey, right? Cells have, the human body has an immune system, yeah? And you guys have all been infected with a few viruses in your lives, as I'm sure you know. How many would you say? It's got to be hundreds, yeah? How many times has your body lost so far? Your, the win-loss record for your immune system, depending on how you quantify a win, and how you quantify a loss, but effectively, the way I see it, my immune system is undefeated. Yeah? Right? Because I've never, I've never died yet. Yeah? I haven't died once. Yeah? Does that make sense? Is it possible that there are viruses that, that can beat your immune system? 
Sure, people die of disease, yeah? People die of bacteria, people die of viruses, right? The immune system can be defeated, yeah? But so far, mine's doing pretty good, yeah? And for everyone, the immune system is a formidable foe for any pathogen, yeah? And we've talked about that, yeah? Messing around with the human immune system, you're messing around with a pretty, pretty formidable foe, yeah? And we'll talk about how formidable it is after lunch, yeah? What about a bacterium? Does the bacterium just sit there and take it? It fights back. Do you rem we've already talked about some mechanisms. So ligase is the countermeasures against the, the bacterial immune system. What's the bacterial immune system use? Restriction enzymes. And what do those do? They chop up DNA. You're going to inject your DNA into me? Oh, yeah? Well, my restriction enzymes are going to chop that DNA up. Yeah? But viruses, they can glue them back, right? The virus glues them back together. Yeah. So as it turns out, there is CRISPR, which is what's called adaptive immunity. Um, and, we'll, and that's another mechanism. So there is multiple mechanisms, even for a cell that is prokaryotic. And prokaryotic cells are far simpler than, than our cells. But there are still multiple mechanisms by which these cells fight against viruses, yeah? Does that make sense? So, so you're right. The cell doesn't just say, oh, infect me, you know? But as far as the cellular mechanisms, right, they have to put those above the mechanisms of cellular machinery. DNA polymerase is DNA polymerase. DNA is DNA. And when DNA sees DNA polymerase, um, or excuse me, when DNA polymerase sees DNA, it copies it. Whether that's viral DNA or whether it's bacterial DNA, it's still the same molecule. And so the, the machine, DNA polymerase, copies it the same way. Is that, is that good? Great questions, and, and again, right, the, the, uh, for, for all of you that aren't Valerie, right, what Valerie did was run what I was saying against her gut, against her intuition, which told her that it doesn't make sense that the, the cells just sit there and take it, yeah? Does that make sense? Right? Um, and, uh, right, evolution is where living things seek to succeed in their world, yeah? Just like we're all trying to do, you know? So, so if you can walk in the shoes of a bacterial cell or a virus, you'll understand, you're, you come closer to understanding how evolution works, how viruses work, how cells work, yeah? Does that make sense? Right? Um, Right? The thing, that, the thing that I find so interesting about viruses and intuition and, and, and evolution and so on is that they do make sense if, if you think what you would do if you were a virus, if you, think, if, if, if you think what you would do if you were a bacterium, if you were a tree, et cetera. Does that make sense? And I don't think about what I would do if I were a tree very often. But when I do, I get, uh, well, I get happy. And I also, I also get better. When I think about what I, what I would do if I were a tree, I become closer to understanding what trees do. Yeah? OK. All right. So we just talked about the lytic cycle of viruses and I have about 10 minutes more of talking before I can turn you guys out to lunch, yeah? So I, I, I hear people packing up, and that's fine. Um, but I, am, I do want to talk about this, yeah? Oh. All right. You want to take lunch now? All right, fine then. I'll see you guys when you come back. It's... All right, okay. So everybody sit back down. Everybody sit back down. I, I really want to, this is, I think this is, 
I've, I've, got, I've got a couple more things that I want to talk about. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. So, as we discussed, viruses make you sick by injecting their DNA into you, and that DNA is, is read by your cells to make more viruses. The viruses break out, and they release more, uh, they infect more cells, yeah? That is called the lytic cycle, yeah? Because it makes bacterial cells lice, yeah? You understand? So the lysogenic cycle is a little different. So everybody look at this, and Julian especially, because he just sort of described this a little earlier, yeah? So you see the lytic cycle. It's on the left. The virus injects its DNA. The DNA is read by the cell. The cell makes more viruses, and the viruses break out and go and infect new cells, yeah? Consider this now. The virus injects its DNA, and now the DNA splices itself into the DNA of the host cell, right? What happens when this cell divides? The virus is, is duplicated along with the cell. And if the cell is successful in its life, then what? The virus will be successful, yeah? What about this? Is when we consider the lytic cycle, is there concern for the welfare of the cell? Right? So pretty much there is zero concern for the health of the cell here, yeah? You understand? What about with the lysogenic cycle? What happens if the, the cell dies? The virus dies, yeah? This is a completely different set of circumstances, and yet lysogenic viruses can utilize the lytic cycle, yeah? These are viruses that are a little more complex than the basic lytic virus, yeah? These are viruses that can splice themselves in to the genome of the host cell. You understand? Right? And when they do, they don't want the cell to die, right? Because if that cell dies, then they die. But if that cell is successful, if this cell forms two and then four and then eight and then 16 and then 32 and then a million, then the virus will be a million-fold successful, yeah? Which is pretty successful as far as I know, yeah? Um, guys understand? Right? So, so why these two are the basic, these are about bacteria, but both of these cycles have relevance to a eukaryotic cell like a human, okay? Julian, you have, you've had your hand up for a bit. All viruses, some viruses can only do this. All viruses can, that can do this must be able to do this also. Does that make sense? So he said, can some viruses do both the lytic and lysogenic cycles, yeah? So in order for, to have a particle, in order to have an infective virus, we have to have this cycle, right? Otherwise, the virus will never leave, yeah? And um, you, you, uh, and as it turns out, if you look at the human genome, there are the evidence of viruses that infected us and stayed forever, yeah? Um, that are, and that were passed down to our children um, and are now a permanent part of our genome, yeah? But any virus that's going to infect somebody else has to leave, yeah? Does that make sense? So we have to have this cycle um, also. Understand? Julian, again. You have confused me. Uh-huh. Uh, you better ask that on you better ask that when I dismiss people to lunch because I'm still I'm still not getting it and, and I've 
I've got one more slide. This is it. And then I'm going to turn you guys loose for lunch, OK? So I skipped over a bunch of different kinds of life cycles for various viruses. I went to HIV, just because HIV is pretty important. Last time I heard, yeah, duh. And then um, it has some interesting parts of its life cycle. It is, a, it is an RNA virus. And when it infects them, it, it infects you, it has an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, yeah? Can you guess what reverse transcriptase does? It does transcription backwards, yeah? And what is transcription? Taking DNA and using it to make RNA, yeah? DNA to RNA is transcription, yeah? So what does reverse transcriptase do? RNA to DNA. So it takes its viral genome and converts it into DNA, yeah? Where does that DNA go? Into the nucleus of your cell, yeah? And what does it do when it gets there? Splices itself in and makes itself right at home inside the genome of that host cell, yeah? Is this cell going to get better? This cell is now <coughs> infected, yeah? And there is no mechanism that I know that's going to get that virus out, yeah? Is that clear? Um, so, um, is this like the lytic or lysogenic life cycle? It's like the lysogenic life cycle, and, but, but there's something special, which is that um, this cell, right, the DNA of the virus is now in the nucleus, and just as the cell can make a, a messenger RNA of anything else, it can make a messenger RNA of the virus and make all those viral proteins and release viruses in perpetuity, yeah? This, this cell is a permanent, living, virus-generating machine. Understand? Right? Um, and so it can churn out viruses until it dies. One by one by one, yeah? Um, so there's a bunch of, how does this all happen? Well. We've seen several stages of the life cycle, yeah? Binding to the cell, getting the DNA in, or the RNA into the cell, turning the DNA into the RNA with what? Reverse transcriptase. And then getting that DNA into the genome with another enzyme called integrase, yeah? And then busting out of the cell and using other things to, to, to move on to the next cell called proteases, yeah? Are there drugs to treat HIV? Yes, there are. Do you guys know why? Because Uncle Sam and other governments threw tons and tons and tons of money into research on HIV. Why? Because it's an important disease that kills people. Yeah? And so, do you guys know some of the drugs? Well, think about it. This is reverse transcriptase. What is reverse transcriptase based on the ASE suffix of its name? An enzyme. How do we fight enzymes? With inhibitors, yeah? So, so every step of this life cycle that depends on an enzyme is a potential place where we could make a drug, yeah? So somebody goes to the doctor and says, I have a cold. What does the doctor say, Joel? Go home and drink a bunch of fluids. Yes? Right? So, someone goes to the doctor and the doctor says, you've got AIDS. What does the doctor say? Go home and drink fluids? <laughs> no. That person gets the drugs, yeah? And again, those drugs exist because there is extensive research to make those drugs. You understand? But the way those drugs work is not radically different from the way other drugs work, yeah? Penicillin is an enzyme inhibitor, yeah? Um, tetracycline is a, is a ribosomal inhibitor, yeah? Reverse transcriptase inhibitors are drugs that are, that are part of the cocktail of drugs that HIV patients take in order to not have their disease progress. You understand? Right? Along with that, there are integrase inhibitors, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, etc. Every step in the viral life cycle is a target for 
a, an inhibitor drug as long as that step of the life cycle has viruses that, or has enzymes that help those things work. You understand? Yes. Yeah, so, so why do you have to take many drugs to, to keep HIV at bay? What do we know already about HIV? It evolves really fast, yeah? And if you only take one drug, then if it gets a lucky bounce on its evolutionary changes, then it's going to go around that, it's going to evolve a way to, to circumvent that single drug, yeah? circumventing two drugs or three drugs is multiplicatively harder than dodging around just one drug. Does that make sense? Getting three adaptations in a single generation is a lot harder than just getting one adaptation in a single generation. You understand? And that's why people take cocktails of drugs to keep the virus at bay is because that keeps the virus from evolving a way, a solution to a single drug. D does that, is that, is that good? Okay. Great, great. Um, <clears throat> all right. So that's all I got, yeah? Um, so it's now 1218. We'll call it 1220. Come back at 10 to 1, yeah? Okay. <clears throat>